Chapter 12 of Stone and Story 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stone and Story 8, August 1930, by Various. Earth the Marauder, Part 2 of a three-part novel, by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 17, Casting the Die. Somehow Sarka believed that this white radiance of the abyss held the secret of the omnipotence of Luar, if omnipotence she possessed. That she did seemed sure, else Dalis wouldn't have been with her. Besides, she had asked Sarka and Jaska to swear allegiance to her. Yes, the secret was here, in the heart of the lake of white flames. It might have been the moon fountain of youth, or if omnipotence... There was no turning unless Sarka tried an experiment. His fury at Dalis now knew no bounds, and he was conscious of a desire to point it almost to be born in some way to circumvent the arch-traitor. For here in the craters of the moon Dalis was working out a strange amplification of the scheme which he had, centuries before, proposed to Sarka the first. He was subjecting the people of his gens to the white flames. If they immersed themselves voluntarily, they became as Lua was, but still subservient to the will of Dalis, and in his hands invincible instruments of war. Dalis had doubtless already been bathed in flames. Sarka wasn't sure, for in the home of Lua the white light was so blinding it would have been impossible to make sure that the white radiance closed the others with Lua. That's it, said Sarka to himself. That's it. Dalis and those guards at the days of Lua have already been subjected to the white flames. The rest who immerse themselves voluntarily come forth as Lua and Dalis, who don't die. Dalis' manner of forcing the survival of the fittest. His idea of the flood in grandfather's time, only now he causes his selection by flames instead of flood. He believes that only those worthy to survive and to stand at his back in whatever he conceives to be his need, will guess the secret of the immersion. The others will die. What a terrible alternative, when Dalis could as easily have given the secret to all his people, could have told them how to save themselves. But it wasn't Dalis' way. Here, in the beginning of what was to become a dual sovereignty of the moon, Dalis had already taken thought on the matter of overpopulation and was destroying the many that the few, the strongest, most ruthless, might survive. Hundreds of thousands, millions of the gens of Dalis stood at the door of life, and didn't know how to enter merely because Dalis withheld the key, and pausing in terror before the flames they died, when a step and a plunge would have saved them all. If he lives to be a million, if he lives through everlasting life, said Sarka to himself, and does penance through a thousand reincarnations, Dalis can never atone for this wholesale destruction of humanity. But I... I wonder... Sarka realized the nicety of the revenge of Dalis upon Jaska and himself. Dalis hadn't given the secret to the prisoners, but by his use of the cubes he had plunged them into the very heart of the horror, where they could see the suffering of the people of the gents. Then, when they had seen and appreciated the horror of it all, they would follow the people of the gens to death. But Luer had spoken of thrusting them into the base of the cone. Then they were not for the flames, after all. How could it be done? The glow composed of the cubes had but to transport the prisoners to the base of the cone, press against the base and open to let the prisoners free, and in the heart of the white blue column they would be hurled outward from the moon into space. The mere prospect of such horror caused the perspiration to break forth anew on the body of Sarka. But there might be a way. I wonder, he asked himself, if the earth people in this crater could read my thoughts in spite of their agonies, if I could get my thought to them through the globe. I wonder if, reading my thoughts, they would obey. Bit by bit, as parts of a puzzle fall into place, he made his plan, and his heart beat high with excitement. 
Jaska bent before him to look into his eyes, and he knew that she was trying to read his face. She knew, wise Jaska, that this brilliant lover of hers was making a plan, and she believed in the sure success of it because it would be his. She smiled at him, her courage high and waited. Holding the ray director between his body and that of Jaska, he took a terrible, ghastly chance. Dalis had known the secret sign manual of these two, but would the intelligence of the cubes comprehend it? He must take the chance, slender as it seemed. His free hand began to spell out with all speed the mad plan he had conceived. The white flames are harmless if one plunges into them voluntarily. Are you afraid to attempt it? No? Then unfasten your clothing and have it so arranged that you can drop entirely out of it when I give you the signal, which will be a mere widening of the eyes, like this. You understand? We must go nude into the flames so that they will bathe our whole bodies. But when you slip out of the clothing, tear your anti-gravitational void from the skull pan of your helmet and hold it in your mouth. Then depend upon me and have no fear. I have no fear, replied the fingers of Jaska. I go to death with you if you wish, or to life. Feeling the menace of the cubes almost gripping at his throat as he got into action, Sarka unfastened his own clothing, ripped the ovoid from his helmet, placed it in his mouth. Then, looking at Jaska, he gave her the signal. Instantly, at her nod, he brought forth the ray director, pressed it with his fingers, directing its muzzle toward the curve of the globe, swinging it around in a circle, cutting out the bottom of the globe of cubes. The action must have been one of untold surprise to the cubes which made up the globe, for before anything could be done to stay the hand of Sarka, his ray director had cut out the bottom of the globe and Jaska and himself, divested now of all clothing, had fallen from the globe. Unbearable heat slashed and tore at them. They still held hands, and when their feet touched upon something solid, they were gasping with the unbelievable heat, and it was ripping at their lungs like talons of white-hot steel. But pausing not at all, Sarko raced ahead with Jaska, and dived straight into the lake of white flames. As he dived, he directed his thoughts toward the people of the gens who stood, undecided, dying by slow inches on their little oasis in the lake. And this was the thought, which was a command. Plunge into the flames, they will not hurt you. Plunge in and obey my commands, O people of gens of Dalis. I, Sarka, command that you obey me. Jaska, who commanded you at the will of Dalis, also commands. Together with Jaska and me at the base of the cone, you have but to follow the converging of the flames. Together the two plunged in, and it seemed all at once as though the fire had gone out of the white flames, for they were cool and soothing to the touch. Sarka could feel new life being born in him, could feel himself revitalized, exalted, lifted to the heights. He suddenly experienced the desire to run, and shout his joy for all to hear. But reason held him. Not thus easily would Lua and Dalis, the traitor, give over their designs against these two. But in the heart of the flames they dropped down, while they turned their faces toward the base of the cone, or where they thought the base to be, even as Sark gave another command to the now invisible people of the gens of Dalis. Hold your all voice in your mouths and follow. Obey my will. They dropped now to what seemed to be cool flagstones, while above them showed an orifice in a wall, into which those tongues of flame were darting. They paused there, side by side, their faces radiant, and looked back the way they had come. Coming out of the white flames, like battalions on parade, were the people of the gens of Dalis, scores and hundreds of them, who had sensed and heeded the mental commands of Sarka. Like genii appearing out of the flames they came, to master about Sarka and Jaska. Then, when it seemed that no more were coming, Sarka turned to the base of the cone, his face high shining with courage and confidence, and stepped straight into the flames that led into the cone. 
Beside him came Jaska, while behind him came the people of the Gens of Dalis, who dared to do as he had commanded. They were sucked into the cone like chips sucked into a whirlpool, and Sarka willed a last command as they entered. Quit the column at the leap of the crater, and master about the air cars. Chapter 18 The People of Radiance The exultation of Sarka knew no bounds, and looking into the eyes of Jaska he knew she felt it too. For her face was shining, and all of her, the wondrous shining brilliance of her, was bathed in the white radiance that mantled lure. And now, since Jaska too knew that radiance, her beauty was greater even than that of Lure. Sarka thrilled in you at the glory of her. But even as he stepped into the base of the comb, he stepped out of the blue column at the leap of the moon crater. Swift as light and swifter had been the flight upward from the cavern of the cone. Yet, so keen were his perceptions, he knew when he had passed through the chamber of the bluish glow into which he and Jaska had first dropped upon arrival. Now they were on the lip of the crater, and the people of the gens who had followed him were slipping out of the blue column like insects out of a flame, and converging on the air cars whose tentacles still waved at their head when Sarka had last seen them. Sarka looked at these people in amazement. To him there was a divinity now about their nudeness, which nudity never before had suggested to him. For the people shone, and there was something glorious in those divinely white bodies. They reminded Sark of his people's books of antiquity, and his childhood's pictures of angels. But the effect of those white flames... There was no explaining it. But Sarka felt that whatever he willed to do, he could do, that whatever he wished for was his, whether it was his by right or no. He felt that he could move mountains with only the aid of his hands. Looking at Jaska, he conceived all sorts of new beauty in her, for she was the brightest to him of all the people who had passed through the lake of white flames and been cleansed in their heat. No wonder Lua has mastered the moon he cried to Jaska, for when she was bathed in the white flames, her will is paramount. But how, if she passes the people of the gens of Dalis through the flames, will she retain her sovereignty? Because Dalis too had passed through, and his will is the will of the gens. They will obey him, and he was sworn allegiance to Lure, or given some sort of oath of fealty. How strange that but one person on the moon has been bathed in the white flames! How do we know, Sarka almost whispered it, that she is originally of the moon? Does she not look too much like our people to be from another world entirely? I don't know, but you mean... you mean... I scarcely know what Dalis would swear allegiance to no man, much less to a woman, unless he knew that man or woman, far better than he has had opportunity in a matter of hours only, to know lure. He left it there, then, as he strolled boldly with Jaska by his side to the nearest of the air cars. As he approached the car, the gleam cube beneath it seemed to gleam brighter and brighter, as though it echoed the radiance of Sarka. Sarka knew, studying this phenomenon, that he possessed at least a hint of the secret of Lura's omnipotence. There had been a hint before, but by now its meaning was clearer. The white flames out of the heart of the dying moon gave new life, exultation, not only to the bodies but to the brains of those who passed through it, and with their brains quickened they possessed such knowledge as men of earth for ages had wished to possess. Transmutation of metals, the ability at will to endow the higher, more selective metals with intelligence and the ability to retain command of the intelligence is thus endowed. This explained the power of lore of the gnomes, and the power of the gnomes of the cubes, if they possessed that power. But the gnomes, what of them? What were they? But for a space Sarka must away the answer to that question, for there was little time. Already he knew that the tale of his escape and his taking over of a portion of the gens of Dalis must have gone like wildfire through all the crater, and from this crater, perhaps, had been transmitted to all the craters of the moon. All the craters. 
that explained to him the absence from the lake of white flames where he had seen so few, comparatively, of the people of Dalis Gens. The moon was honeycombed by such craters, and perhaps the white flame connected them all, made them all one. And Lua commanded all from her days in this crater Sarka and his people were escaping. The millions of the gens had been swallowed by the craters of the moon at command of Lua, acceded to by Dalis, and all over the moon the very things which Sarka and Jaska had witnessed were taking place. Even now, as Sarko raced for the air car, and Jaska with him, he could feel a backward pulling that was well nigh invincible. Someone was willing him to return, willing the gnomes to pursue him, willing the cubes to refuse obedience to him. But he laughed and stepped to the air car, passing by the nearest writhing tentacle as though he knew it possessed no power to harm him. The tentacle swept aside and didn't try to bar him, while he sent his will crashing against that brightly gleaming cube. Into the air car, we enter with you. The cube vanished instantly, and it seemed to Sarko that invincible hands caught at his feet, lifting him up through the trap drawn the belly of the air car, up and inside. The door swung shut, and in the forward end of the vast air car gleamed the cube, which had obeyed his command. Sarka sent one thought careening outward from the air car, a command to the cubes which stood watch beneath the other air cars. Obey the radiant people, and through them, me. The light of the cube made the interior of the air car as light as day, and Sarka was struck at once with another phenomenon. He could see through the sides of the car in any direction and what he saw filled him with a sudden fear. Out of the crater poured myriads of the gnomes, and up the sides of it came myriads of the gleaming cubes all racing toward the cars. Get back! Get back! he commanded the gnomes and the cubes. At the same time he issued his commands to the cube within his own car, and to the cubes which by now were inside the other air cars realizing that the cubes themselves were the motive power of the air cars, and that his will was the will of these individual cubes. Fly at once! Fly outward at top speed toward the Earth! Instantly, at though single signal had started all the cars, a dozen air cars rose majestically from the crater, while Sarko studied the gnomes and the cubes in turmoil on the rim. He noted then a strange circumstance that when he commanded the gnomes and the pursuing cubes to keep back, they hesitated, dazedly, as though they didn't know whether to advance or to retreat, that when he merely watched them, they came on. He laughed aloud at this measuring of mental swords with Lua and with Dalis, for he could sense the conflict very plainly. She commanded the gnomes and the cubes to attack, he commanded them to retreat, and they remained undecided, like people drawn between two extremities, and as certain which direction to take. Upward, side by side now, floated the air cars of the moon, and in the forepeak of each, one of the gleaming cubes, like, like anti-gravitational ovoids of the moon. At the fast falling rim of the crater boiled the gnomes and the cubes, stirring and tumbling, hampered by their very numbers, as they tried to attack at will of Lure and retreated in confusion at the will of Sarka. Then there was Jaska beside Sarka, her face fearful, as he pointed off across the gloomy expanse of the moon. They had beaten Lure and Dalis but for a moment then. Now, at her command, the countless other air cars were coming in to head them off, to fight them back to the surface of the moon. It would be a race against time, and against death. But of at least a dozen of the air cars, Sarka was master, and he didn't fear the issue. The strange exultation which the white flames had given him filled him with a confidence that nothing could shake. He shot a thought at the gleaming cube in the forepeak. Faster! Faster! There is no limit to your speed! Faster! Faster! Even faster! Instantly the moon seemed literally to drop away beneath the dozen air cars which carried the radiant people, 
while the echoes of Lua and of Dalis fell hopelessly behind. Sure that they would win in this race now, since he was just beginning to realize the vastness of his power, the all-encompassing, all-mastering power of the human mind and will, which the white flames of the moon had made almost godlike. Sarka turned his eyes toward the coldly gleaming sphere in the star-spangled heavens ahead. It was the Earth, and it seemed ringed in flames. From its edges there seemed to shoot long streamers of yellow golden flames, which broke into sun-like pinwheels of radiance at their tips. Something, there on the precious Earth, was decidedly wrong. Instantly, telepathically, he sought to gain mental contact with his father. Father, we are coming, he said across those countless miles. What's happening? For a full minute there was no answer. Then it came, feeble, broken, weighted with fear, but it was a thought message, unmistakably, of Sarka the Second. Hurry, son! Hurry, for Dedes has indeed betrayed us! I couldn't maintain control of the earth with the barrels, for some strange catastrophe has destroyed all the barrels in the area Dedes ruled. The shifting of the positions of the Earth and the Moon has so altered the relative effects of the pull of gravity exerted by the planets that Mars has been brought into dangerous proximity to us, and is already so close that her ether lies a plane over us. Surely you must be able to see them. We have received messages, but as yet I have only been partially able to decall them. What I have decoded, however, presages catastrophe, for I am sure that Mars and the Moon are in confederation, and that the Moon people have deliberately forced us into contact with her ally. Cold fear clutched at the throat of Sarka as he caught the message. He decided not to tell Jaska for the moment. He looked to right and left at the acres on either side of him, then issued his commands. Faster! Faster, be prepared to land in the area of the Gens of Cleric, as close as possible to my laboratory. A strange, awesome sight, that flight of the rebels of Dalis Gens from the moon to the earth, like gleaming stars across the void. Far out in space they fled at terrific speed through almost utter darkness, but their light was still blinding, lighting the way. End of section 12